Hello, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. I'm your host, Danilo Cuellar, and today we're going to be discussing the philosophy of liberty from my blog post by the same name. Voluntarism is a philosophy that advocates for complete individual freedom through recognition of self-ownership property rights and by adhering to the non-aggression principle. Self-ownership is the principle that you and not the state 100% own your own body and are the sole decider of what you put into your body, how you treat yourself, or if you want to end your own life if you so choose. Property rights is the principle that you and not the state, 100% own the fruits of your own labor, which includes justly acquired income and possessions. You are free to do with your property as you choose, which includes destroying it, passing it down to future generations, selling it or giving it away. Non-aggression is the principle that you will not use force to infringe on the freedoms of another individual and expect the same treatment for yourself. The only exception to this would be if someone is using force against you, then using force via self-defense is completely justified. We are not complete pacifists. Every animal recognizes the need for self-defense to ensure survival. Hence the existence of claws, fangs, venom, and poison in the natural world. We all live in three temporal planes, past, present, and future. These are signified by property, liberty, and life. The past is signified by property as this is the representation of your past labor and time spent, aka the fruits of your labor. Violation of justly acquired property would be theft. The present is signified by your by your liberty or the ability to move freely and do as you please, so long as it doesn't infringe on the basic freedoms of another individual. Violation of liberty would be assault, rape, slavery, or involuntary servitude. The future is signified as the ability to live out your life to the fullest possible lifespan. Violation of life would be murder. Voluntarism dictates that all interactions between peaceful individuals should be voluntary and consensual. There is never a reason for the curtailment of the aforementioned natural freedoms. If such a person attempts to do so, then you must resist him or her to the extent that it is humanly possible. This is regardless if such a person is a family member, friend, stranger, or government agent. There are two basic lines of questioning to determine if you are in line with the voluntarist philosophy. Here's the first. Number one, do you use violence to solve problems in your daily life? Two, do you advocate others use violence to solve problems for you? Three, do you think the laws of morality, the immorality of initiating force, change based on the number of people in a group? If you answered no to each of these, then you are a voluntarist. If you answered yes to any of them, then you may be a sociopath or a psychopath. The second line of questioning is 1. Is it okay for you to steal, assault, rape, and murder others to achieve your goals? 2. Is it okay for a small or large group to do so? And 3. Is it okay for people to advocate for government to do so on their behalf? If you answered no to each of these, then you are a voluntarist. If you answered yes to any of them, then you may be a sociopath or a psychopath. When the immutable laws of morality, natural law, common law, golden rule are applied to family and friends, we become decent, compassionate, and virtuous. 
when they are applied universally to the whole of humanity, we become voluntarists. In order for principles to be useful and practical, they must have universal application. Like the laws of physics, chemistry, thermodynamics, or mathematics. Just as there are no exceptions to these laws, there are likewise no exceptions to the laws of morality. I end with a quote by Robert Higgs. Anarchists did not try to carry out genocide against the Armenians in Turkey. They did not deliberately starve millions of Ukrainians. They did not create a system of death camps to kill Jews, Gypsies, and Slavs in Europe. They did not firebomb scores of large German and Japanese cities and drop nuclear bombs on two of them. They did not carry out a great leap forward that killed scores of millions of Chinese. They did not attempt to kill everybody with any appreciable education in Cambodia. They did not launch one aggressive war after another. They did not implement trade sanctions that killed perhaps 500,000 Iraqi children. In debates between anarchists and statists, the burden of proof clearly should rest on those who place their trust in the state. Anarchy's mayhem is wholly conjectural. The state's mayhem is undeniably, factually horrendous. So, voluntarism. What is it? Now, a lot of people may not be familiar with the term voluntarist. Um, there's other synonymous terms, um, including anarchist, um, anarcho-capitalist, um, free market advocate or free market anarchy, free market capitalism, laissez-faire capitalism, things like that. Um, but a lot of them boil down to similar principles, which is individual freedom, self-ownership, property rights, and the non-aggression principle. So, there's an interesting uh, concept to think about, which is, anarchists do not oppose laws because there are laws all around us, right? As I, as I mentioned, laws of, laws of chemistry, laws of mathematics, laws of physics, laws of thermodynamics, these are all laws. The difference is nobody created these laws. These are discovered laws. These are natural laws, right? A law is immutable, not unchangeable, okay? It does not come about at a whim. When a physicist discovers laws of planetary motion, for example, they're only useful or practical if they're true and if they apply in every situation, right? <laughs> there should not be exception to laws. Laws are, by definition, universal. However, when you have the concept of government, which is, by definition, placing near unlimited power in the hands of a small group of individuals over the majority, the inevitable result is corruption, tyranny, oppression, slavery. Because we must understand what incentives are brought about when such a state is constructed, right? Um, so when you have positions of power, just like any other vice, I guess you would say alcohol, gambling, sex, drugs, any kind of, not to say drugs should be illegal, but in a sense it could be a vice, a crutch, a psychological crutch. Um, when other empathetic portions of the brain are underdeveloped or have been neglected through... Um, failed parenting. When you have a system of power like the federal government, 
you get it, the, the types of people that it attracts are not the virtuous, right? Not the decent, not the compassionate people. The types of people that are decent, compassionate, and virtuous don't really want to rule over other people, right? They're basically content with living out their lives, following the path of virtue, maybe studying philosophy, maybe improving their own lives. And if they so want to in improve the lives of others, the way to do that is not through government, which at its essence must exist based on the immorality of taxation, right? The theft of the property of others, right? Taking the property of those who have earned it and giving it to those who have not earned it. So government is by its very nature immoral, unjust, and tyrannical, no matter the size there are gradations that you can say some governments are more tyrannical than other governments, but the general trajectory is clear. The path is unmistakable. And to compare governments, say my government is better than your government, <laughs> is to compare cages. And the goal is not to get into a, a better cage. The goal is to leave the cage, right? Complete freedom, which is what voluntarism act, uh, advocates. The voluntary interaction between peaceful individuals is a very simple concept. Very simple. And one thing that we have to keep in mind is that the natural inclination of man is not to rob, assault, rape, and murder his brother and sister or his neighbor, but rather to um, get along, <laughs> to trade peacefully, um, engage in relationships, form organizations, right? Again, there's some people, some people make the, um, the erroneous assumption, well, you know, we have churches, we have condominium complexes, you know, you join a condo complex, you run to the board, you, you know, um, you join whatever, the YMCA, you join various organizations, the chess club. <laughs> this is the same as government. You have a president, you have a vice president. Really? It's the same as government? Do chess clubs wage war against other chess clubs? <laughs> Do condo associations print their own money and force the people to use it and then thereby confiscate it stealthily through inflation? <laughs> Do churches spy on their own citizens? I guess you can make the case for God, but... <laughs> no, there's a big difference, big fundamental difference between the federal government and these organizations. Even you can say that there's a fundamental difference between state governments and the federal government in that again the state governments cannot print their own money, they cannot wage war, um, they can't do a lot of things, <laughs> right? So it is the federal government that has the ability through the Federal Reserve to print money out of thin air, force the people to use it, and then thereafter, through hemorrhaging of uh, fiat currency, rob the people of their purchasing power, slowly but surely over the successive generations. This is the unique characteristic of government, federal government. So statism, or the belief in government, is a belief that people are not to be trusted, that people are evil and immoral at heart, that given the chance we would all rob, assault, rape, and murder each other, as in that movie, the wretched movie, Anarchy, The Purge, or The Purge. Um, and this is very um, disturbing to say the least. I can only assume that this is the product and the result of... Um, relentless government indoctrination in government schools 
as well as uh, the assistance of the media. You see, destruction and fighting and violence is not beneficial to the state. It's damaging, economically damaging to the state. Right? If you want a, 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 an efficient economic model that doesn't include destruction, efficiency is in providing people with a product with value and then they agree to trade money, true money, not the uh, counterfeit confetti toilet paper trash that we use every day, but real money, such as gold and silver or Bitcoin, for that valuable product or service. That is how to increase wealth. That's how to increase the standard of living and promote progress of the human condition. Technology has been the savior of our species. It really has. Government has essentially remained unchanged and constant throughout the millennia. Go all the way back to the ancient, ancient Egyptians, the pharaohs, the god kings of, of ancient China, the Sapa Incas of South America, the emperors and kings of Europe. It is the belief in government that has produced the most atrocity, the most warfare, the most suffering and blood and death that the world has ever seen. Religion pales in comparison. It pales. <laughs> Government is the belief in authority. The belief that some people, depending on the clothes they wear or the badges they flash, can subjugate and rob from other people. It is the belief that some people are special. There's a great quote by Frederick Bastiat. He says, uh, "The state is the great fiction, and everybody tries, everybody tries to live at the expense of the state, when in fact the state lives at the expense of everyone." So whenever you hear someone say, "The government should do this," or "The government should do that," <laughs> you have to think, where does the government get their money from? Right? Essentially two ways. The mandrake mechanism, or also known as fiat currency creation, printing money out of thin air, quantitative easing, or taxation. And until recently, uh, a lot of uh, attention has been given to civil asset forfeiture, which is another <laughs> even more heinous way to uh, seize, since it's since with fiat currency creation through inflation they rob your purchase, purchasing power over long periods of time and so therefore it's not so easily felt by the people and so they don't resist it, right? They, they don't see the theft because it's not immediate, it's not obvious, but the theft is going on. It's the theft of purchasing power, right? The ability to print money out of thin air is theft. And taxation is just a way to, a fancy name for plunder, right? Legal plunder, where the state claims ownership of the people's wealth through their income tax and through the myriad of other taxes, property tax, withholding tax, gas tax, <laughs> any, anything you can imagine has been taxed. And now we have civil asset forfeiture, which has been getting more attention recently, which is basically the IRS being given the ability 
to confiscate and seize and rob the people directly from their bank accounts. Right? So the banks become snitches, right? They there's a regulation in place that says if there's a deposit or a withdrawal made that exceeds ten thousand dollars, the bank must notify the federal government, must notify the IRS. And the IRS will come investigate, and most often the IRS will confiscate and seize the money. <laughs> and they consider that suspicious activity. So again, we're witnessing the fact that the government claims complete ownership over your currency, money. Absolute and complete control. Which is just another reason not to keep your money in the banks, please. I hope people understand this. And if you don't understand this, please research the bank bail-in in Cyprus that happened last year, around April. Just a quick summary of that. It's a um, little island in Cyprus uh, in the uh, Mediterranean Sea. Um, I think it has about a million people. And uh, apparently the banks were insolvent and they're about to, I guess, close down and they, they asked for a bailout from the European Union. And the European Union basically... Um, so, so they froze the people's bank accounts, right? So it's called a bank holiday. You know, you go to sleep. Often the bank holidays happen on the weekend, right? You wake up Monday morning and your account is frozen. Can't touch it. Nothing in, nothing out. Very scary for people who have uh, foolishly put their life savings in banks. So bank holiday. And it ended up for two weeks where they were deliberating how much money to tax from the citizens. They called it a haircut or an expropriation. But you can say simply to rob. How much money to steal from the people. And in total, what they ended up doing was people who had over 100,000 euros were robbed about 49% of their deposits, which is just <laughs> shocking. So it was outright confiscation, outright theft. And <laughs> of course, most of the um, population of the world did not really take much notice. But the banks around the world sure did. <laughs> and since then, I believe the banks in the European Union and Canada and the United States have all made very um, minor changes to their policies that most people don't even notice. Which basically says that uh, in the case of um, financial instability, instability or financial emergency, they reserve the right to your assets, right, to your deposits. Because you must, remind, you must keep in mind that when you deposit your money in a bank, that money is no longer yours. That money is not yours. You are loaning that money to the bank. The bank can then do with what that money, with, as they choose. They can <laughs> loan it out to other people. They can gamble with it on the derivatives market. They can do whatever they want. They can blow it. <laughs> they have no accountability to you whatsoever. So if a bank goes bankrupt or insolvent during a financial crisis and you have your deposits in there, you are an unsecured creditor. So there's a totem pole of people that will be paid if a bank goes insolvent, but you're not on the top of that totem pole. You're at the way bottom. So there are many, many people that have to get paid if the bank goes under before you actually see a dime of that. So it's highly unlikely you're going to see anything if the bank goes under with your money in there. So please, people, get your money out of the banks. <laughs> Do yourself a favor. So... What does this have to do with volunteerism? <laughs> kind of on a tangent. Um, 
So the philosophy of voluntarism or anarchy or anarcho-capitalism or free market anarchy is we do not place our faith and trust into those people, those sociopathic political rulers who claim ownership over our lives and promise us that things will be better under their rule. How could they? How could things be better by one person or a small group of people? How can a small group of people realistically improve the lives of millions of people? It's logistically impossible. There's only one person that knows how to improve your life, and that's you. <laughs> you know best how to spend your money. You know best what foods you want to eat. You know best what health care you want to buy. You know best what education you want to pay for. You know best what job you want to work in, what profession you want to enter. You know best. It is about the individual. It has always been about the individual. There is no such thing as a collective. There's no such thing as a country, as the United States. This is a fiction. It's only people, people who collectively believe in a fiction, in a mythical entity known as government. And this mythical entity has special magical powers that the individual does not have. And they can do things that the individual cannot do. <laughs> and to a certain extent, that's true. Because people have hallucinated that it's true. Right? They can rob people and call it taxation. They can indoctrinate the kids and call it public education. They can spy on people and call it surveillance. They can kidnap and cage innocent people and call it the war on drugs. They can go overseas and kill people from other lands and call it war. We have to take off the blinders and see the world as it truly is, not as we would like it to be, as it truly is. And then maybe we can make changes towards constructing a better world for our children and our grandchildren. It is our debt to the future that we would improve the life of the planet, of ourselves, for the future. We may not live to see a truly free and peaceful and voluntary society, but that's not to say we shouldn't try. Some people say we shouldn't even try for a voluntary society because we never had one. What kind of an argument is that? It's quite similar to the abolitionist in the 19th century who was met with incredible opposition by the slave masters who would assert, how can you advocate for a life without slavery? We've always had slavery. We must recognize some, some things that's important when you're uh, battling some status is to recognize logical fallacies, right? So that would be a logical fallacy of argumentum ad antiquitatum. The fallacy of antiquity. Or the appeal to tradition. Because it has been done this way, it must always be done. Circular argument. It does not prove anything. No logic whatsoever. It is the logic of fools. So, please people, research voluntarism. Google voluntarism. It's a simple philosophy. And just like Einstein in his search for the grand unified theory, he wasn't searching for many, many little theories. He was searching for a grand unified theory. If it is simple, it is usually beautiful and true and accurate. When we do away 
with the large rules, we end up with many small rules. And that is the very definition of the welfare state, of the war on drugs, of the surveillance state, of public education, of the tax code, of regulations. <laughs> the myriad of laws, there are thousands, tens of thousands of laws and code. Right? There's a book by, I think it was an attorney, Harvey Silverglate. And the title of the book is, Every Day You Are Committing Three Felonies. So we are all felons every day. So stop, support, stop supporting the immorality. Support yourselves, support your neighbors, support your entrepreneurs, your business owners, the people around you who truly provide value to your life. Those are the people we should be supporting. Not some parasitic welfare far off in the distance whore that promises us freedom and utopia but delivers us oppression and tyranny thank you this is peaceful anarchism on the voluntary virtues network wishing all of you have a wonderful day take care